Hello everyone, I'm Leilani Cawthon, the CEO and publisher at the Learning Council News Media and Research Organization. Also a proud Edu Jedi Grandmaster. I'm here with the Edu, Edu Jedi today for Activity K11, which is gonna be a discussion about the uh, foundational ed tech leadership and particularly what's basic and not so basic. We're gonna let a sort of free flowing conversation happen today. We're gonna to have with us um, uh, Dr. Sharon Reberry, who's the principal from Virtual Schoolhouse from West Ada School District, Idaho. Hi, Sharon. And also Phil Jankowski, who's superintendent from Anchor Bay Schools up in Michigan. Happy to see him again. And then we have with us also Dr. Wendy Oliver, who's the chief learning officer for Edison Learning. And what we want to do today is start off with uh, Dr. Wendy Oliver and Laura, Laura Grasso. Hi, Laura. Uh, who's instructional specialist from Edison Learning. Give us a little professional uh, grade color behind this whole conversation before we dig in. So if you guys want to introduce yourselves, then I'm going to uh, go to um, my other guests to make sure there's a full introduction of their school districts and then we can dig in. All right, go ahead. Well, thank you, Leilani, for allowing us to participate today. We're very excited to be here. These sessions are so meaningful um, and I, I learn a tremendous amount um, every time I'm on one. So. Um, to give you a little bit of background about Edison Learning, uh, it's hard to believe, but Edison Learning has been around for approximately three decades. Uh, Edison Learning offers digital curriculum and content, uh, but we also have instructional and guidance services as well, and we serve students um, and partner with school districts in multiple states. We have approximately 150 middle and high school courses. Uh, no elementary, although there have been a lot of requests. So um, with that, uh, I think that Leilani, we can just move on. I know we have a lot to cover today and I'm really glad um, Dr. Grasso is here with us today because uh, her expertise is in data and research. Oh, perfect. Okay, great. All right, so I wanna go first to um, Dr. Sharon Reberry and give us a little intro to what you're doing and what's been happening for you. I thank you so much. Um, so I am, starting year two as the principal for the virtual school house in the West Ada School District, and we're located in Meridian, Idaho. Um, and so this happens to be day four of our school year, um, getting ready. Um, it's it's the time of year where you're navigating all of these things. And I think once in a while when you're uh, at, in the virtual world, that navigation becomes a little more intense sometimes. Um, we're still navigating those enrollment students coming in, um, as you're all well aware across the country, the mask versus no mask and all of that kind of thing. So we're still helping families navigate that. Um, we have to bring families in to check devices out, have them pick up supplies. Um, and now we're being required to also have them do all of our state assessments in person. So there's a lot of navigation there aside from everything else we're doing right now with gathering data so that we get to know our students. Um, for their placements. Um, so this year, actually, in year two, we were able to add some additional staff, which is help. We need more data to rely on that. So we've added gifted and talented. We've added honors at our secondary level. And then we've also been able to add um, a person who is going to focus specifically on digital citizenship and keyboarding and things like that for us. So to me, this conversation is very timely um, because as we're beginning to look at that data and talk about what that looks like, um, we're understanding how powerful data can be um, and it's helping us to provide those opportunities for students. So thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today and engage in the conversation. Great, well, it's good to have you. All right, Phil, uh, can you give us a little intro to what's happening for you yeah um actually i am just transitioning now this is uh, my first year in anchor bay was in a my previous district we were fairly um a data savvy technology savvy district we had we were really big into competency-based education and we had those data conversations. Teachers were were really about all of that. And then now I've transitioned. It's a much larger district. So going from district of about 2000 to about um, 5,600 and starting basically from scratch where there's, we don't have the technology infrastructure. Data wasn't really part of that. So our conversations so far, um, six weeks in have been beginning right from the, the the ground level of let's look at growth versus proficiency. Let's look at how do we measure that? What's success for the kids? How can we use technology, especially if we end up having to go 
virtual again in order to kind of make sure that we are um, reaching all students and, and really have um, those connections um, for them so that we can sustain learning throughout all of um, whatever the pandemic throws at us. Okay, so different sort of scenarios here. That's good, we have a variety. All right, so let's get into the conversation. So when we talk about basic or not so basic, we're coming at this from, you know, the EduJedi Dictionary, these cat, you know, categories of definitions. And we're gonna start with the definition of account. This is not something that everyone usually understands. I know it's a simple conversation, um, but it's, you know, the identity created for users. And when you get into teachers, you know, having to also create their own accounts, that's where things get messy. Um, so any comments need to be made on this one, Wendy? No, my only thinking as I review the terms is maybe on account or perhaps maybe password is something different, but, you know, we're seeing so, so much more the need for two factor authentication, uh, especially with some of the security risks that we've seen in online learning over the past year, year and a half. That's a good comment. Yeah, and, and um, Phil, as you're going to start addressing maybe the um, elementary level kids, you know, fingerprint, thumbprint kind of a thing might be important for you. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it just, it's interesting now, especially when you talk about accounts, it's, I, I try and equate to, to my staff that just like your cell phone is for you as, you know, the, like, the vice that you can't, accounts now are, are much different for younger kids because they have everything, especially if you have single sign up, they're using your accounts across all platforms. And that account is their life, just like your cell phone is for most adults now. And so they just have to understand that. Okay, good. Sharon, any comments on this one? No, actually, I was kind of at the same place where Wendy was thinking about that two factor authentication and how you have a username, ex password, et cetera, and how those are all beginning to become tied together for for that single sign on um, piece. And that is something that that is really big for us, especially in the virtual world where kids are not here to have hands on assistance if they get if they get stuck or lost. OK, good. Good comment. Um, all right, so let's go to API um, application programming interface. Do we need to make any comments on this? Okay, I'm go going once, going twice. All right, so I want to talk a little bit about big data. This is what we all kind of would hope technology was doing for us. It wasn't so manual. <clears throat> um, but it all comes down to you can't really get really good data unless you are capturing the data. You've got good data uh, storage, analysis, search, sharing, visualization, all of the other, other things. We're seeing the big data conversation really explode in the really big districts because they really want to be able to predict, like, are we going to get dropouts because all these sixth graders are flunking math? What is happening, right? Um, but this particular definition sort of also ties in with big learning, which comes right after it. But big data starts with, are you capturing data? So let's talk about that for a second. Phil, you want to go first? Yeah, the, this is, it's interesting because this concept with teachers, oftentimes they kind of, um, they're, they're a little off put by the fact that, you know, education in general is a human endeavor. And you it's hard to quantify into a, a data type system. And the, to them, making a transition seems impersonal. And then you, I try and explain to people, and like, you know, if in the medical world, they a lot of doctors use the Isabel system where it's not there to take the place of the doctor, it's there to help them diagnose things and use data to leverage that so that now you have more time for the human mm -hmm. parts of it. It makes you more, more productive so that when you are in front of that student, you know what, what they're what they need and, and what you can do for them, and it makes you a better teacher. So that that's really the big concept, I think, of big data that to get across. Yeah, and I think what you just said is really part of this whole conversation of how do you lead uh, in the in this whole basic or not so basic realm. You're you're suggesting lead your teachers to use data so they see a positivity from the data that makes them more efficient. That's a good way that. A good way you said that. All right, uh, Sharon. Um, yeah, I would I would 
echo what um, what was just said. Really, we are going to focus this year too um, on that diagnosing and being more efficient and effective in where we're placing students so that we really can understand, are they learning, are they not? Um, and we also have to take a look at ourselves as the educators in what is the data telling us about what we're presenting and how kids are, are taking it in. Um, so I really think diagnosing and being effective um, in what we do is really important with that data. Okay, thank you. Uh, Wendy. Now that Laura's going to talk in a little bit about some of the ways that the instructional team at Edison Learning is now using data um, to make better informed decisions. But as I reflect on the comments that have been made, um, you know, I think one of the biggest things is to also have that application, like training teachers how to apply what they're seeing in the data to make those modifications in the content. And oftentimes big data will do that for you and make recommendations for students. But I think so many so many districts are at the stage where they're just beginning to harness that data. Uh, it's it's critical that maybe the word application be added to that definition. OK, Laura. Yes, um, Edison Learning, we are really trying to focus on this aspect. Um, this is a, a undertaking that we've been focused on to really say, what is this data telling us? What do we do with these data? Um, and how do we make it a better experience for our students? Um, so in, in approaching data and how to use it most effectively, we looked at what are the most successful school systems doing? If you looked at some of the huge reports, such as those put out by PISA, the Program for International Student Assessment, that addresses 600,000 students from 79 nations, the quality, equity, efficiency, and learning outcomes across these countries. There were a lot of prominent things they had in common. Some of those things, professional development, it was frequent and it was meaningful. Collaboration and using data. So we took those things and we tried to really build something with that to be like these successful school systems. So our professional development, we actually call it professional development for learning as a combination of professional development and personalized learning, but more of a focus on are we following up? We're not just giving it to you and not talking about it again. Are we following up? Is there a direct application? Is it engaging? Is there deep learning? Within those professional development for learning, we try to provide our teachers with how to be data literate. So data guided learning. How do we use data to inform learning? Teachers as researchers. How do we, I mean, teachers have to be researchers. You're a researcher, whether it's formal or informal, you are a researcher. Um, you just don't typically do it in a very formal way. So this is what we're trying to encourage. How do you use peer reviewed articles to support what you do? What's, what's reliable? What's valid? Um, so is it based on evidence or are we just trying things? If you think about how much the world has changed in the past several decades, and how much education has changed or rather not changed, we have a long way to go as far as evaluating our impact and seeing what we can do about what we're looking at. Um, it's like a doctor, you know, make the reference to a doctor again, uh, just like Phil, I believe, was referring to. If you had a doctor come up to you before surgery and you asked him why you do that specific surgery and they answer you, I've just been doing it that way for a while. You wouldn't take that. You wouldn't like that at all. So you want to have something to back what you're doing. So we've taken these things as professional development, collaboration, and data, data informed learning, and we've put it together to have a project that teachers follow throughout the year. Every group, every team, we call it data inquiry team, has an area of improvement or AOI, we termed it, that they follow throughout the year. And it's very empowering for the teachers because it is their own. They pick it, they're responsible for tracking it, and they're responsible for following through this collaborative inquiry cycle in which they're gonna assess it, look at the research behind it, see what's working and continually modify. And they do this in data inquiry teams. So it's a collaborative approach. They're gonna continue to assess what they do, and they're gonna disseminate at the end of this. 
So not only are we keeping it locally within the groups, it's very interconnected. So all the teachers can learn from each other. Um, so that's really what we're trying to do with this data, <coughs> with these data. And I think that not a lot of people have been really taking it that far. And I think we have a lot that we can share with other people to learn. And I think this is just the beginning of it. I think there's a lot more that can be done with data. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, research has shown that those who review data several times a month are more likely to close achievement gaps than those who review only a few times a year. Um, so that's what we've been focused on. And I, I think data literacy is going to be huge now and going forward, especially. Good. Well, thank you for all that. I think one of the things that you commented on, I want to take back to uh, Sharon and then Phil, and that is you, you mentioned, you know, basically teachers becoming investigators. It's not normally something you're taught to do in college when you become a teacher. You kind of think that as you're going into the classroom, you're really you're leading content and you're leading the distribution of the content and the getting back of the essays and they have the tests and blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> you're not necessarily taught to be an investigator. Sharon? No, that that is very intriguing to me. Um, we do. And when you just um, said that about looking at data at least two times per month, we have um, our PLCs or our professional learning communities at each grade level or content area that are beginning to do that this year. Again, going back not only for the student's perspective and are we doing what they need, but also for that that teacher as the learner themselves about where can I improve my practice um, through that the inquiry cycle that you mentioned. Uh, and and I think you called it area of improvement or something like that. Um, but we do that through PLPs or professional learning plans where teachers have to set goals and what the data means and how that looks. But what I am finding is that we have to continually visit that conversation as to what that looks like, et cetera. So, so I think it's all, all flows together that way. Okay, good. Good comment. Uh, Phil? Yeah, it, really along the same lines. I mean, if you stick with that medical model we were talking about that, that's what we kind of talk about is it so much of it is finding using technology using um strategies so that you know the background of students and then you diagnose kind of where they're at and then you're trying to kind of fill in those areas where they need help and you really can't do that and the traditional model was like like you mentioned it was content we're going to come in i need to cover this content and now it's time to, to step back and look and say, OK, how can we reach each of these kids? And you do that because you need some kind of system that's going to leverage things so that you can you can see where they're at, whether it's on a standards based system or a competency based system um, and then and react to that instead of just going in with your plan on. I want to cover this. You, you're really looking at it on a student by student basis. Excellent, <clears throat> Excellent comments. All right. So. Um... Let's move on to big learning. So I, I just, the only thing I think we should probably mention that we haven't covered already on um, big learning is that the networking companies are talking about big learning from that last sentence, student mobility with personalized lessons. So for example, students carrying their iPhone or any kind of smartphone into a grocery store and they would get a automatic pop-up from the school because location awareness knows they're in a grocery store and the grocery shelves are using IOT, you know, Internet of Things and everything else, the student can do a, a math performative right there, like shopping for a full meal for under $20 for four people. That Those kinds of little performative <clears throat> internet awareness of all the things could be used by schools outside of school based on location awareness. So that's sort of where big learning is going. Anybody want to make any comments on that? Um, just just one thing on that talking to um, again going through with teachers it's the it's hard for a lot of people to kind of get those concepts down and the analogy I always give them is it's probably like Netflix or anything like that where it says oh you like that it's it's the whole nudge theory where again I see you're here we can have you do that you like this show we're going to lead you to this other show or amazon and, and look how well that works for encouraging those behaviors and you can leverage that same thing for learning to make it in you know real-time learning in real life situations 
beyond what the artificial things that you try and construct in your classroom. Exactly, which is sort of now society's expectation. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say to add to that, you know, I noticed when we were talking about big data, we focused a lot on teachers um, and teachers going in and actually having to, to look at the data and the trends um, and how they could apply that data. And then when we transition to the word learning, big learning, we're looking more at systems. And I, I think it's so critical. Um, and I, I actually think, Phil, maybe you said this at the beginning, but it's critical that the, the big data, um, if it can be system generated, uh, serves as a tool for teachers to save them time. Good comment. Okay, thank you, everyone. Uh, let's go to Caliper Analytics. I just want to brush over this basically an interoperability specification, you know, for data analytics, how systems trade data with other systems. So it's something just to know about. You can check it out at imsglobal.org. Another one of those standards is Common Cartridge, also at imsglobal.org. Let's get into course planning and scheduling. Um, the original Edu Jedi, when they made this definition, said course planning and scheduling is an extension of a learning information system or service. <clears throat> and that's what LIS stands for, for planning and scheduling. Just one comment from Learning Council is that this during the pandemic has been literally the hardest thing and very, very few schools and districts have what we now call hybrid logistics because course planning and scheduling up to the pandemic was primarily a two rail system, traditional public school with grade segmentation, class, and then course segmentation using whole groups. During the or the second rail was the all online, right? Which which still could be whole group oriented or it could be individually paced. Then what happened during the pandemic was people wanted to say, okay, I can only be there on Thursdays. My child can only come then, right? Or I'm not coming to school. I still want to be associated with the school, but I want to be one of those Zoom kids. Um, so and then schedule alteration all over the place, like my child only wants to be affiliated with your school for sports, so everything else is going to be online, but but in the traditional way, or maybe a non-traditional way for some of the courses, so that, that that warping of space and time was phenomenal. And many districts are talking about how that scheduling of time and space is so hard. Phil, can you address that first? I, I think that's the, the large challenge that everyone will face this year is, you are going to see over and above the, the typical diversity that you have in your students. Now you will have students who might not have been in the school building at all last year, mm -hmm. might have been half time, might have been in school every day. Or So now you, how do you reach them where they're at? And I really think that if you can develop a system, and again, speaking from experience in my previous district, um, just yesterday, the state released all of the, the assessment results, and, and in Michigan, it was like, oh, they really went down. And then looking at what we had done leveraging this system, we were the only district that showed growth in every area because we could meet the kids where they're at. And so there, there's a lot of potential if, if you can leverage the technology and take this approach and where everything's kind of integrated, um, there's huge benefits for students. Okay, good. And I think we did have a proposed hybrid logistics definition. I'll get to that one later. Sharon. Yeah, you know, that was interesting listening listening to this because the same thing was happening in Idaho too. Look at how the data and, and it we didn't have gains, we didn't have the growth. But when you really come down to it, depending on how you look at it and the kids that were there before or not, you know, there's so much that goes into that data and, and, and how it's interpreted. Um, but I did want to comment on that course planning and scheduling because being that virtual school, we are seeing exactly what you just mentioned. Their kids are wanting to come to us only for their electives or only for their core, and they want to do sports elsewhere, or um, we have a situation where we're providing all of the actual general education courses for some students, but they're going to their boundary school for their special education services. So we're we're getting a lot of different requests and, and balancing what that looks like and how, how we can do that um, has become a big conversation for us. Um, so it it's happening and the philosophy, I mean, I think we all should be as 
somebody said it a few minutes ago, whatever is best for kids. Yeah, that's a competitive position since a lot of school districts are, are losing so many kids. Yeah, you know, they're like, I'm not going to do this with you. Like, I'm just going to homeschool or I'm going to do an alternative school, and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Yeah. And I think to add to that, I think it's just that mind shift change, too, because 18 months ago when everybody shifted to online and now we're coming out of that and you're going back to face and fa face to face, but you still have online. I think there's a an understanding that that kids aren't necessarily now choosing online because of COVID. There's additional reasons that it really works for families. And so I think continuing to look at that mindset and, and how we all look at that and we can work together again for the what's best for the kids. Yeah, so I think it's appropriate timing. I'm sorry I was scrolling while you were talking, but um, I think it's appropriate time before we go to data literacy. I want to read you the def because it's not it's not it hasn't been put in here. I want to read everyone the definition of what hybrid logistics is because it's a new technology addressing this area of planning. You know the, all the weirdness that you guys are experiencing. Um, so hybrid lo logistics reimagines the old grade and class structure in favor of a course structure. So the real pivot in the future is course. Um, that includes the digital workflow management that can be either individually placed or still group paced, right? Hybrid logistics create independent student progression, a rearrangement of students into fluid membership of, of what we would call houses. Learning Council talked about this in the last three special reports. Phil, I know you're shaking your head. You've seen them. Sharon, I think we handed one to you when we were up there. Um, yeah. So a house is kind of like the Harry Potter world house, right? Like your house Slytherin, your house this. You might be virtually associated only, or you might physically come into the building. You're in some, you know, super classroom, socially distanced, but you're only flighted out then to your classes on an Uberized basis in a cohort that has reached a point that needs the class. The rest of the time, the teachers might be intersecting with you on a one-to-one -one basis, one-to-two, one-to-five kind of a thing. But it's a complete alteration of the structure if you wanted it that way, or only two hours a day, you're, you're altered that way for electives or for remedial. The rest is this traditional model. Um, so essentially algorithms determine when to close the cohort and live teaching intersection. If they're individually paced, um, that would trigger notifications to all the calendars and the teacher might then in this extreme example of hybrid logistics, teach the same thing four or five times a year. Because the first cohort arrived triggered the intersection. The next cohort arrived triggered it. Meanwhile, teachers going back to the ones way behind and saying, um, I gotta I gotta get these people caught up, these kids caught up to move ahead to catch up with the other cohort, or they're gonna miss a testing date, kind of a thing. So it's a very customized but algorithmic time and space use. That's the emerging technology in this area. Just want to comment on that. So let's go on to data literacy. The ability to know what an ideal situation will be like. We played a, a data literacy game on the road back in the day when we were traveling. We're not going to do that again until later this fall. But data literacy, all of you guys have mentioned it. So um, as we're looking at this definition, it gets into these things. The types of error points. And I really, truly believe that if you don't know your error points of data, which is the same thing as looking at a kid and saying, this kid has the wrong goal. This kid has a surface surface explanation only understanding. This kid is operating on a falsehood of how fractions work. This kid has um, given an essay about the Civil War with dropped out time, like they think it happened yesterday. <laughs> like so, so the understanding of data at a deep level is this definition. Do do we want to comment on this, Sharon? First. Oh, sorry, I was still reading it to see <laughs> where. Yeah, so this is a deeper definition of data literacy intentionally in here. Why don't, okay. why don't I come back to you, Sharon? Phil, I don't, I don't think we played this game when we were up there. No, okay. um, but I, I'll, this kind of goes along with the conversation that um, we were having in my previous district where 
so often, especially when you when they're writing either it's a project or assessment or something, or if you're doing something, it, it's at a superficial level of just right or wrong. So maybe the distractors on a question are just randomly placed in there. It's like, no, you ha you should take it to the next level so that you can kind of diagnose what's the misconception that student might have. So if they're the distractors are going to be the common misconceptions they might have on something. So then you can kind of see, is this something that as a teacher that I can make into to kind of drive my instruction? Because if I see kids are, are kind of responding in this way, now I know that this is the the misconception they have and I can go back and kind of um, approach that from a different angle. And it's just, it's another level of just really building upon what they're already doing, but now making it meaningful in driving instruction. I, I completely agree. And I, I just made a note here that we should probably include as a data error point, the, the trigger for a teacher to know the child might have a data error point is that they're distracted. Because mm -hmm. you just talked about distractions. So the teacher's trying to unravel what's, what's the misconception. So this works at the individual student not getting something this level as well as up here in data analysis right because all this comes from data analysis sharon do you have a comment on this yeah so is as um you've been talking and, and doing that i i was thinking too uh, that that the way we look at data really it has to be in a continuous mode um, we have to do it effectively Teachers have to be able to interpret, act upon it, and then communicate not only with their own team, but with parents, with administrators, um, all the way looking at those data errors as well. Um, I have my teachers do things called data dips so we can kind of see are the kids going down and, and again going back to that impact and the effectiveness of, of the teaching and learning. Um, I guess it all comes back to those creating those outcomes for kids and again what's best for them yeah yeah and i and um i think more and more people need to be trained on what data literacy is we've been talking about digital literacy for years but i really believe the whole industry of education is up to really needing immersive data literacy which includes these simple concepts like what is a data error point Mm -hmm. you know what is a positive point you know a good data point would be these things um so so <clears throat> i think wendy or laura you guys might have a comment on data literacy too i just want to comment one thing that i heard both phil and sharon say multiple times is teacher and i think sometimes when people hear big data or data literacy they think um that the technology is doing all of the work and again, I just want to reiterate that these are tools for teachers and they have to have that data literacy in order to be able to apply what they're seeing. And as we look more at the hybrid logistics model um, and the need for scheduling, the scalability is, is really the reason why teachers need this data given to them or shown to them where the, the um, artificial intelligence can see, okay, here's where the student didn't learn this particular standard. Um, so that way they can have more time to be a facilitator and actually work directly with those students based on the data that they're seeing. Exactly. Hey, Laura, did you have a comment? Yeah, I mean, to add to that too, and you all are hitting on it also, um, but, you know, I think initially when we started this, I think Phil referred to teachers kind of being scared off a little initially by data. You hear that term and you think, you know, that's not my job is more of the qualitative, um, the kind of fuzzy feeling part of the job. And that's all great. And you cannot, it doesn't mean you can't use that. That's your intuition, your experience doesn't need to be in a separate box than data. You can still apply your intuition, your experience, but have that data to parallel it and to follow along and support what you do. And I think the other part of it too was scaffolding. Um, but where, you know, when we're speaking with students back and forth and providing feedback, um, one of the biggest things we need to determine with the data is from the data we're getting from these students, how do we scaffold? How do we help them get to where they need to be, but not 
directly scaffold, let them have the learning, let them be responsible for their learning. Um, so that's another big way to use that data because once again, we want to meet the student where they are. Okay, thank you for that. All right. Um, <clears throat> all right, so we're going to so just maybe brush over this next one, if everyone's in agreement, uh, a data map, which is essentially something that the tech side normally does to make sure that the fields that you have coming out of one application map to the fields they're supposed to go into in another application. So any comments we need to make about this or should we move on? Okay, let's move on. We, we don't want to have to deal with that anyway. Let's let the tech guys do that. Um, so data-driven decision-making, I think we've talked about that. Um, let's talk about next discrete digital. So this is the type of content that's the interchangeable piece rather than a full system. There's pros and cons to both. Um, the most discrete digital ranges from just a concept, right? Like a few sentences, a clip, or an image um, all the way up to, you know, part of a larger lesson, as long as it's contextualized with tagging, like this goes with the Civil War, this goes with this. <clears throat> Discrete content is pretty much the way uh, initial schools and district teachers who haven't, do not have a full awareness of everything of, of available professional grade. They're trying to build all their lessons somewhere with discrete digital pieces. Um, this then gets into a whole bag of worms about instructional design, quality user, user interface, but they're very resistant because they've always sort of pulled together this chapter from the textbook they had, this video from somewhere online. They're used to discrete digital. They're not used to professional grade and what it could do for them. Discrete digital <clears throat> has the huge problem of being very, very, very weak in data. Doesn't pull data. It doesn't do much in terms of giving back, you know, outcomes of how kids are doing. Phil, I want to go to you first to talk about this difference between what is discrete digital and the sort of professional grade stuff. Well, I, I think just it, I think you hit it right on the head where, again, as teachers kind of move into this, in, in, in my experience, they start pulling in these individual discrete pieces and not really understanding like how they can necessarily work together and and kind of building things together. Um, I, I think that then it, it the focus that we try and have is, it, is you're trying to build a cohesive, um, whether it's a course or it, but then you you're, you really want it to be discrete on the learning aspects of that. And so you have this integrated so you can have these concepts, in the, if, especially if you're doing something where, hey, I want to have multiple representations of a concept. It's not just one way. So now I have this other these other things that are going to show it in a different representation. So for those kids that just need to see it from a different angle and and then what am I going to do to kind of like challenge kids and how can I build that in? Um, and have a system that's going to automatically do that. And sometimes you can do that where it level, where it leverages it pretty well. Um, I've seen some learning management systems where they have that, where it, it's you can integrate your different pieces together, and depending on where a student's at, it's going to either nudge them up and, and challenge them, or if they need remediation, it'll track that in. So that's a great way to do it versus the the discrete where it's now I'm kind of at a dead end because this is the technology I had and it was a one shot deal. Now what do I do? Exactly. I think you framed that very well. I think I want to go next to maybe some screen sharing by Laura about the about what's happening on the professional grade non discrete side. Well, inclusive of discrete too, right, Laura? And then I'll come back to Sharon. Okay, Laura, I think you have share capability now. Yep. Thank you. Yep. We see it. We see it. Okay. All right. Um, so this we have, this is what a lot of, of our teachers have been doing to provide additional help for students. Um, it's a, you know, additional collection of sections from our courses. So these are essential instruction pages, right, from our courses and work page, um, work pages, 
And on here, too, you can have offline access um, because you can download the PDFs. Um, there's supplemental extra practice worksheets, um, and they are sent right within the course. Um, so they're just extra supplemental things that, the, that teachers provide so that there's extra practice, um, places where you can get to these components that you can download, easy, download easily, you can within the course or through here. Um, but it's, once again, another way to help our students to provide extra ways to meet them where they are. So that's the discrete pieces. Where's the jumping? Can you show me the professional grade system for the jumping off points? Yeah. Because I think that's the difference that I wanted maybe for you to show. What's the difference between a professional grade system that contextualizes everything and then and then yes, there's discrete additions to that. Right. Did it follow me with the share here? Yeah, there you go. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so this is within our system. Um, this is what they the students follow through. They have the essential instruction component. They have the instructional videos, the textbooks that they can download as PDFs. Um, mm -hmm. If they need, they have the reteaching. There's also extension of material, um, and it's all within one spot here. You have the course map as you walk through it step by step. Um, it will guide you, you know, based on algorithms, what is needed, whether that's reteaching um, or if you complete it, you move on to the next section. Okay. Yeah, so that's what I think we're saying when we're talking about the difference between purely discrete and mm -hmm. things that have all this context and sequencing around them. So I'm imagining, Sharon, you have some, some things that are similar to what Edison is showing now. We we do. We're working towards that. Um, we do. Okay. Um, we use some systems that help with that. Um, but I think I think it goes back to it, it's learning how to do all of this because we have to be willing to give up. And I think somebody said it earlier, give up that how I've always done it. And it also means trusting the system. Um, and and working it all to get because we really do want to ultimately end up to where you were just showing that mastery or that competency based system where the system helps us get to that point, but still allows the teacher to do what the teacher is good at doing, presenting the learning. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, I'm so, I'm so glad you said that because it's kind of a scary thing to bring up. It's mm -hmm. essentially saying to a teacher, you know, the way that you've always been, we're going to we're going to make you more efficient to do the the real teaching more yeah. Phil could, do you want to comment on that yeah, it, it's it's really taking systems like that allow for um, districts a, a, to be more productive and efficient because it kind of reminds me of um, when I was student teaching way back when and you know, there's so much intuition in teaching where you teach a lesson. I remember my um, supervising teacher telling me, she's like, oh, that lesson seemed to go well. I'm like, yeah, I felt like I was the best teacher in the world. And she's like, did you ever think that they probably already knew it and you just kind of wasted an hour? And, and <laughs> she was right. And until you use a system like that, you don't realize that you're just going through the motions because those kids might have already known it where, a, if you're using a system that's competency based like that, it's productive struggle every day. Your kids are getting better every day. And it's the only way you can do it is if you have that, the data that kind of tells you that they, they're ready to move ahead and the system that's going to kind of prompt them in, in some kind of cohesive, organized manner. Totally agree. Totally agree. Okay, so we have some more to get through here. Um, let's skip over goggles. We kind of know those. We can skip over instance and We've already talked about learning information services a little bit, so we, I don't think we need to get into that or this other standard by IMS Global or Machine to Machine. I do think we need to um, talk about uh, on, on and offline accessibility. And I think you did just show a screen on that too, Laura, right? Okay, so you showed screen on that. So we could, should go back to meta tagging because the thing about tagging things, let's say you're using Google or Outlook for a lot of stuff and teachers are sharing folders. 
if things are not tagged or the document's not um, methodically um, named in a certain way, and we had another event where we talked about tagging as like a big thing that has to be addressed. So can we talk about tagging for just a second? Because this is a fall down point for finding even your own content that you made on your own system. Phil? Yeah, it, it's... I guess this is, I like to look at it as it's the opposite of kind of, you know, we were talking about discrete technology. It's like when you when you get into, especially in instruction and all that, those concepts, you, you really want to be able to drill down to those discrete concepts. And, and this is how you do it is through meta tagging. Um, where, where, like, I've seen it work best is if you're now, if you have a competency-based system, so you have the standard or the competency or whatever, and, and now you're tagging those individual pieces to that, and now you can stretch it across to even, like, teacher evaluation. So if they're doing something in class and, and like, we had a video system where we could rec the teachers would record themselves, and then you could kind of tag that to the other concepts. So now you're drawing into their professional practice, and you can see because across those standards hey this person did a great job with this standard now why don't you look at that and and now it's it's really just refining their practice and and being able to break those things down to um those on the concept side of things yeah excellent point uh sharon you know i i think that really is a good point we always talk about being able to refine what we're doing and with that meta tagging and I really hadn't thought about it to that professional practice level with evaluations, but I really, I really like the idea of that where people going back to that PLC concept really could work together um, doing those instructional rounds looking at the parts and pieces of the lessons and where kids need additional assistance or where we as educators need that. Um, so I hadn't really thought of meta tagging in that way, but now you you really intrigued me. Well, good. Let's hope other people are intrigued too. Okay, so <laughs> let's move into um, one roster. That's another standard. I don't think we need to go get into that or the next one, open video standard. Um, but professional di um, digital, I, th I think I want Wendy um, and Laura to pipe up on this one because there, there is a distinct growth in the professional digital world and, you know, Edison's on to be able to share about it. Go ahead, Wendy. Uh, I'd like to tie metadata into uh, professional digital. And, you know, I think about when I was developing my own online classes as a teacher, right, trying to keep up day to day. And I compare that to where I'm at now in my career. And I see there's such a difference with having a, a full fledged development shop, right? folks that are dedicated to just development, they can actually put in that metadata as it's needed to drive a lot of the big data in the machine learning. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of that for commercial grade, there's a lot of work behind the scenes uh, to make sure that you're able to search by competency. Uh, and I love the idea too of connecting it to professional practice. Um, and I know Laura can show some of our, our content and you can kind of see the difference with the professional digital. Go ahead, Laura, and then I want to ask Laura and Sharon something about that. Okay, so going back to our course here, um, like Wendy mentioned, um, a lot, well, all of our courses are tied to standards, and we have our contact team who is whose sole job is dedicated to our content, making sure our content's up to date, make sure our content is clear, thorough, um, and making sure that everything is aligned to the standards. We all know that standards can change, so making sure that we keep up on that with all those changes. So as I showed you before here, we have these different modules. You can run through the essential instruction, and it has these different components as far as the instructional video, if needed, if you fail your assessments, the reteaching, um, and then your extension. So it's built nicely within this based on the standards, aligned with those, and focused on what is needed 
by having that content team keep up to date on these. Additionally, oh, we're at your WebEx screen. Yeah. Okay, there you, you go. Them? I see okay, it. Additionally, we have these really nice pacing guides um, to help the students stay on track, you know, especially in an online environment. It's really can be really challenging if you're home trying to work virtually, um, especially for students of this age. So we have these pacing guides where you can see here they've gone through, but if they, let's say they to the lesson 10 quiz, all of these prior to it would say complete and the plan completion date would change based on that. So it's a really convenient um, management within the system to keep the students on task and make sure that they're at the right pace and it will continually update as needed. Okay, good. Here, um, to help with those standards and aligning, um, we have several reports, one in which would be the standard report shows you all the unit and lesson objectives that correlate to those units so that we can make sure that the standards are aligning with the objectives within each unit. Okay, perfect. Um, all right, so I'm going to take the screen back from you and I'm going to tie in my question to Phil and Sharon um, from the viewpoint of the next definition looking back at professional and discrete. Um, and that is, you know, if you're a teacher in an existing school, you kind of almost usually want to say, I want to use some professional grade maybe for these things or your superintendent like Phil is. Or, or a principal like Sharon, you're gonna almost wanna mandate some professional grade courseware like that, but then you have all these other discrete moments, right? Like you got, they're fill in, right? So in terms of your system, you have to be a systems thinker, like this definition, thinking about the management discipline of your entire curriculum map. Um, so, uh, Phil, I want to come to you first about talking about that systems thinking between discrete and prograde. I I believe this is where the challenge is, and this is we're we're sort of in the wild west of the professional and digital. There's hundreds of pieces of technology that do individual things very well, but not interconnected in meaningful ways. I mean, the, the number one gap that I see is typically it's the curriculum development between that and the instructional side of things. Um, most districts, most teachers are using things separately. And so they're not, again, they're not changing, adapting their instruction or their curriculum based on off of where their students are at, because there's no meaningful way to really have that interaction. And so you have to, if you want, to really move in the direction where you're trying to reach kids where they're at, then you have to have that systems thinking of how am I going to get across these different platforms that might have been the built for discrete purposes to, to talk to each other or produce some kind of meaningful information that you, they can then do some action on. It has to be actionable data that's going to drive what they're doing. Yeah, so that's really the leadership challenge. Is mm -hmm. being able to think with that, yeah, whole thing. Sharon. Yeah, and I would add to what Phil was just saying there because in in our world, when you're when you jump to having to be completely in the digital world, not everything is ready for completely digital, if that makes sense. Um, unless yeah. you're willing to put a lot of money for programs, you know, a program here and a program there, and then getting them all to talk to each other, and we don't always have endless funds to be able to do that so then you get teachers pulling things together from here and there and then digitizing it themselves and then hoping we can get to where we're what we're talking about right now getting the data that we need to continually assist our kids and and having them take ownership of their learning so i think we're on the road to getting there but i still think there's a lot to be done in the space yeah it's messy yeah, Wendy, do you have any comments on this? I would just say even uh, with 
you know, Edison Learning because we have the instructional staff and then we have the content development shop, right, that builds our curriculum. One of the components that helps so much with systems thinking and, and that kind of flow back and forth is quality assurance and actually, you know, testing those products and getting that feedback because you're right, in many ways, you, you're always thinking three-dimensionally um, in, in order to achieve that balance. Good comment. Okay, so let's get through the rest of these. We have just a couple more minutes. I think we can go really fast. I think we've talked about UX, and we're going to get really into UX in another webinar that's coming up later. There's actually two of them on UX UI standards. So I'm going to brush over that one, and I'm just going to have us finish on data visualization. <clears throat> it's as simple as a lot of places that maybe are presenting dashboards to teachers through their LMS, individual apps or things like, you know, full courseware like Edison has been talking about today. They're showing you things like bubble charts. They're showing you bar and line charts. They're showing you 3D bar graphs and the rest of these, you know, a Gantt, a radar chart. And none of us remember our statistical analysis classes from college. So we get lost in the fray. Phil, do you want to comment on just maybe teaching these sort of basics and leading these basics? Yeah, I think this is, again, this is where your data set that you have becomes actionable data. Can you put it in a meaningful way that people can understand it and then act on it? And the the best advice that I have for that is, is again, you almost have to kind of um, teach it as a, as a purposeful thing of like, here's, here's what this chart is for and here's what it's telling you. And the nice thing I've seen over the last three years is it's becoming more standardized in the use of data in the representation across platforms, which is great. And that's it's only going to help kind of build that um, capacity. Good, good comment. Uh, Sharon. Yeah, again, I would agree with what Phil said. It's, it's a process um, because you have teachers who love statistics and you have teachers that don't, but we all still have to use the data in a meaningful way to get there. And so I think, again, on the teacher side, you have to look at what works for them, whether it's a line chart or a bar graph or, or what that means, um, but get everyone together looking at the data and really digging down to like how we talked earlier, getting down to the minute aspects of what they're looking at to help those students progress forward in their academics. Good, excellent comments. This has been a really great conversation. I would just want to end off this whole section because then we're getting into other other sections in in uh, the next events. I just want to make sure that we we have you know a, a little moment here for final comments. Phil, final comments for uh, leading basics and not so basic stuff. Uh, it it's a process. I mean, it, it's something where it took us 10 years in my previous district to get where we felt that everybody was kind of on the same page and 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 can move forward so it's not something that can can really be done overnight and you just i think it's a good time especially if people are looking to start it now because it will the systems are now getting so much better and and it, it's really an opportune time for those people who haven't got on onto this to do so Good, good comment. Um, going to Wendy and then Sharon. Yeah, I'll just say one thing I was reflecting on during today's dialogue was, you know, everything um, when we started transitioning from seat time, right? We, we were so advanced with our thinking then. And I think that we continue to advance in that thinking as the technology allows us. Um, and it, it requires conversations like this and forward thought leaders like um, Learning Council and the, and the folks that are on this call to be able to really keep that ball moving forward in the best interest of students. Thank you. Sharon. Yeah, I would just echo that I think it's a journey that we're all in this together. We're learning, we're collaborating, and it really is having that willingness to be able to step away from that how we've always done it kind of thinking and really looking forward together at all the possibilities and the opportunities that do lie in front of us. Thank you for that. And Laura, I'm sorry, but we're out of time. But thank you for being with us today. And Wendy, thank you. Sharon, um, Phil, thank you for being with us today and our attendees. Thank you for being with us today. And we'll see you next time. September 3rd is our activity L12. 
the digital instructional design workflow logistic versus the Addy's model. This is our first step into a conversation about the new model because we're all digital now. So thank you very much for being with us and we'll see you next time. Bye everyone.